Hey folks, how's it going? You've probably played one or two roguelikes, and one of the most prominent features of the roguelike genre is that they play off the thrill of getting lucky. But Dead Cells instead places an emphasis on skill and knowledge, since you have so many tools at your disposal to control and micromanage your builds, such as the recycling tubes, restocking, and the merchandise categories. Though, builds are still restrained by RNG and money, meaning that builds can only be changed step by step, making it tricky to figure out where to start. Though, in a normal run scenario, half of the time you might come across a fairly self-sufficient weapon that requires none other than a half-decent shield. So, let's talk shields first. All 14 shields in-game as of now scale off survival, so as long as it's not the asshole shield or the knockback shield, since those two are way too inconsistent for most builds, the shield you get is the shield you take if you're running survival, so you should move your focus onto the other components of the build first. But once those are sorted out, your bread and butter survival shields are the rampart, spike shield and the punishment. The rampart needs no introduction, just ruthlessly ram that rusty rampart right in the repulsive wretch's ribcage to attain your reckless iframe reliant rampage. The spike shield and punishment are those simple shields. You press the button, and you deal damage. For brutality, you have your singular bread and butter shield, the frontline shield, which also needs no introduction. Slam that one sexy sucker right in the savage's scrotum to inflict stupidly silly and somewhat start and suffering upon scorpion slashes and all the other scallywags who scramble out of the sewers. Of course, situationally, other builds are going to rely on status effects, and respectively, for survival, brutality, and tactics, you have the ice shield, blood shield, and thunder shield. And helpfully enough, the extra damage to frozen, bleeding, and shocked enemies affixes are highly likely to appear in survival, brutality, and tactics respectively as well. Unfortunately, due to the nature of this not being an exclusively 5 BC guide for the elite Dead Cells players, many viewers will be unfortunate enough to have not grabbed the Thunder Shield yet. But fret not, for only 0.00003 of the Earth's population has one. That means that if you run into two people in public with the Thunder Shield, you could have the same chance of winning the Euro Millions jackpot. Just stick to the parachute for now, it's pretty good. And besides, building and tactics is usually much more complicated than just shield plus primary equals win. It's always tactics, isn't it? Why wouldn't it be? Because tactics is just a quirky, unique different from everyone else. Guys, tactics isn't real, it's a government conspiracy made to make people think banquets is a fact because they're having a as well. Make tactics like no Okay, so take a look at this one, guys. You know how Dead Cells has a shield slot? I just found out that you could put another weapon in there. Neat, huh? I can't really imagine any reason to use another weapon. Tactics in particular is much more likely to rely on a secondary weapon in the build than the other two colours, because survival is largely just unga a bunga, and brutality is not far off either. Making builds and tactics actually require you to think, as tactics is just. <laughs> of course, using a sport weapon isn't exclusive to tactics, but due to the nature of tactics being all about setup and reward, you're most likely going to rely a lot on RNG. Uh, but I mean, uh, make make a complex and varied build. Though of course build making is much more nuanced than that, and the other colours also have options, such as Hattori's Katana and the Pure Nail being able to animation cancel into each other, and the Spartan Sandals knocking enemies just far enough to get a crit from the tipper. There are certainly some generally consistent and noteworthy support weapons that usually won't hurt to pick up in most runs though. The Ice Bow is a somewhat okay support weapon, it's probably the best freeze option, but none of the freeze options are that great. It can be used fairly consistently and doesn't have too short, too fast of an animation, but doesn't have much crowd control either. It's usually not much of a pick weapon. The Alchemic Carbine is an odd case. It's great at what it does, but everything it can do gets outclassed by something else. For affix synergy, the plus 80% damage to poison targets affix is super strong, but for these synergies, Catalyst now outperforms the Carbine. For biomes, you can probably just deal more burst damage by just running around and mashing primary as opposed to firing off a carbine shot first. And for bosses, Corrosive Cloud is good enough for damage and synergy, with Snake Fangs being essentially self-sufficient in terms of the crit condition. The boomerang is solid, like real solid. If you're feeling confident with your build and don't mind taking a few hits, bust out one of these and watch your damage output flip in double. It's insane. Again, the boomerang is basically good enough to be self-sufficient, but one of the biggest shortcomings of using the boomerang as a support weapon is that when you roll an attack, which usually means get behind an enemy, the boomerang returns. The obvious solution here is to parry, but since you're running boomerang as a secondary weapon, that's not quite an option. Of course the cocoon is an option, but given that you've the luck to nab the boomerang in the first place, it's not really a safe bet to rely on the cocoon as a grudge. This makes the boomerang a very win-only kind of weapon, that's only usable at its full potential with specific setup and a good enough seed to not rely on parrying for survivability. So know your build when you pick up one of these, especially since it's very much a damage-only weapon with very little utility. The throwing knife is very much your go-to support weapon if you're not sure. If you're going to forego a shield, this weapon is usually your safest bet. 
It automatically targets enemies with a fairly decent range, making it safe to take out buzzcutters and kamikazes from a distance. It has one of the fastest animations in the game, making it really easy to animation cancel into another attack, and it has what is probably one of the most potent bleed effects in the entire game at 22 DPS base for 3 seconds, giving it a total stack damage of 66. The Blood Sword only has a total stack damage of about 42, and the Blood Shield only has a total stack damage of about 45. Running a bow such as the multiple Nox bow or infantry bow is usually your safest bet, but it usually works when melee builds using the pure nail, star fury or the blood sword. Blood sword throwing knife with open wounds is a very potent bleed build. Now you might be asking, what about the hemorrhage? It's uh, way too slow to be a sport weapon and the total stack damage is only like 9 higher than the throwing knife which can apply stacks much faster. Hakuto's bow, it's still real, it still exists, it didn't get flipped and patched out of the game like everyone's acting like it's been. Flat damage is still decent and Hakuto's bow is still good at what it does. It's kind of a B-tier weapon now, but it's still great for barb tips, carbine, or shock builds. That's right, you heard me. Barb tips. That one still exists, believe it or not. Not like it got wiped clean off the face of the earth. Hokudo's barb tips are still good, still does numbers. Feel free to use a Hokudo's bow with a quick bow, multiple nox bow, build unit, a throwing knife, lightning bolt, boomerang, and god forbid, fire builds. Just don't use the oiled sword, okay? If you're a Dead Cells veteran who's been playing the game for three years ago, you might remember that the boy's axe was apparently unholy. Well, I was busy playing Minecraft back then, so I actually have no idea what the Boy's Axe was like. As of today, the Boy's Axe is a somewhat solid support weapon that does good numbers due to its quick animation and easy routing, making it a solid option for shark and nutcracker runs. Unfortunately, the extent of its usefulness ends about there. The damage is only really needed in boss fights. And guess what? The majority of bosses are largely unaffected by the Boy's Axe. Ice shards. Easy slow, easy damage. Throw these buggers out between the big bonks and you'll have a good time. Recommended for heavy weapons such as the broadsword and giga jacks, just don't get thrown off by the misleading timings. Firebrands have one good use case scenario, and basically literally not an another, which is using the oiled sword. I'm aware that the extra damage to burning targets affix exists, but there are certainly better ways to apply burn than foregoing a shield, and you might as well reroll affixes for something better at that point. The oiled sword. The, the oiled sword, we use it when we run fire blast or pyrotechnics. I guess that's one reason to forego a shield or a melee weapon, except for the fact that shields can also do what the oiled sword does with a fairly common affix. Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought? Now with the Everyone Is Here Volume 2 update, there's been two genuinely worthwhile secondary weapons that, that seem to have been made to be such. If you're struggling with damage and don't really have any particular build in mind, these might be the weapons for you. And the throwing knife now has competition. The throwable objects can dish out pretty insane damage, but will rely on a primary weapon as a consistent damage source. You're going to need a semi-decent primary weapon to snag a few kills to un un and then unleash hell with throwing objects. The stun is pretty worthwhile and with the addition of the baseball bat, this secondary weapon is actually worth picking up over a shield in many runs. It's not great against bosses though, so you might want to keep a shield and backpack for that. The laser glaive is very powerful, but only in niche scenarios. This means that for single target situations, you're going to need a consistent damage source. I don't actually like the laser glaive too much, because, largely because of a grudge I hold against Huntress from Risk of Rain 2, but also because it's so situational, I think it'll be fine as an ability with an 8 second cooldown, just like in Risk of Rain 2. Though not as inherently impactful as the second gear slot, abilities can make a massive difference in your build based on how you use them. I'm aware that choosing abilities is sometimes easier to just take the best ability forward. If needed, abilities are the safest way to activate affix synergy since you don't need to give up a shield slot, instead taking up another ability slot which is far less impactful. Abilities have extremely important applications in various builds, and some abilities are simply irreplaceable in context. Most of the time abilities aren't that useful for DPS, and in no other archetype is this more apparent than in the turrets. Single target turrets are not good. Obviously they can deal damage to bosses, but to be honest you have other much better options, and for biomes you won't really find yourself consciously using them because enemies in dead cells are really squishy. Always have been, always will be. Hey, your barnacle deals damage, amazing. Now let's see how well it fares against this. Now let's bring in the Tesla coil. Look at that, you think you can do that with a double cross? <laughs> no you can't, okay, okay, right. Crusher and Wolf Trap are two of the most well loved turrets in the game, and guess what? They barely deal any damage. What they're good for is the utility they provide. The Crusher is amazing for stun and terrifyingly good against most bosses, and the Wolf Trap can root almost anything, making it a must-have for Shark and Nutcracker runs. Similar thing for the Scavenge Bombard and Heavy Turret. They also give passive damage increases if that's what you're looking for. Also, the Explosive Decoy is uh, not a turret, but I'm gonna put it here. It's more like a grenade, but it's a great ability. It's a get-out-of-jail-free guard, just don't use any attacks whilst your ability. 
It's consistently helpful in tactics runs using single target weapons such as the marksman's bow to get out of tricky situations and clear crowds whilst doing it. Oh, and about grenades, grenades are not your bread and butter status effect abilities. None of them really excel at their job and are mostly not that effective against bosses. Ice Grenade might be fine in terms of abilities, but Ice Grenade these nuts if you think it's a better option than the Ice Shield or Ice Blast. The Fire Grenade is better for damage than it is applying fire. The fire only lasts about 3 seconds, and though the DPS is respectable, you're going to want to pick up like Firebrands if you want fire, which is essentially just admitting to running the Oiled Sword, and by proxy admitting to mental impairment. The Fire Grenade is somewhat good for applying burning oil though. Root grenade is um, okay, but not that good. I mean, like, rooting, who would have thought? Like, there aren't any better options. The magnetic grenade applies shock, which is something it's, like, somewhat okay for if you can't get your hands on the lightning rod for shock synergy. Um, the magnetic grenade is, has the added upside of being, like, okay at clearing out buzz cutters. I mean, it's pretty bad aside from that. The oil grenade. Oh, the oil grenade is actually pretty decent. Using the oiled grenade is great for supporting fire-based runs, i.e. the fire blast or pyrotechnics, and provide a solid alternative to the oiled sword, whilst you wait for a shield with the spread soil on parry affix. I highly implore you to pick up the oiled grenade in runs that have the plus 100% damage to target spells and burning oil affix, alongside maybe the fire grenade, felling throw turret, or any half-decent fire affix. Because if you don't run that, you run the oiled sword, which both means foregoing a shield and admitting to mental impairment, once again. Swarm. The damage grenades are where it's at though. They don't deal amazing damage on their own, but what separates them from the pack is the AoE. Since enemies are so squishy, cluster grenades, powerful grenades, fire grenades, and god forbid maybe the infantry grenade will clear out groups of enemies with ease. The infantry grenade is better for something else though, which is buzz cutters, kamikazes, and rats. Using a run of the mill brutality build often ends up in buzz cutter induced insomnia and PTSD, and the infantry grenade is a great cure for that. These grenades are a reliable pickup if you're running a largely single target focused build with very little crowd control such as the rapier or assassin's dagger. These grenades won't help out too much with builds using weapons with good crowd control though such as symmetrical lance, war spear and tombstone since these weapons already cover the grenade speciality. All this pales in comparison to the best ability in the game however, the hunter's grenade. Nothing is quite as powerful as having an extra stat in every colour though. Am I right? Am I right? Wait. Wait, what is this? No! Look at the mask of my boy. There are many different types of powers, as they are known in Dead Cells, that have many different applications, such as survivability, AoE, single target, utility, and buffs. The nuance in choosing abilities mostly comes from here. Cocoon, Foresight, and Ice Armor are your main damage negation abilities. Cocoon is great for builds without shields, tactics and survival alike, allowing you to parry and avoid damage you otherwise might have taken if you didn't have the cocoon. On shielded builds, however, it's useless. If you're feeling unsafe about health in any other build, shieldless or not, then Ice, Armor and Foresight are the way to go, since both can be used in all colours, the diverse deck being colourless and the Ice Armor having negligible scaling. About Foresight, Foresight is kinda broken. You know how I said infinite uptime Ice Armor is broken in the last Legendary Affix video? Because this is infinite uptime ice armor, except it has a 6 times faster cooldown. Even in low BC you shouldn't be getting hit more than like once every 10 seconds, let alone 5. When using foresight you can still get wombo comboed by enemies though, and ice armor freezes all nearby enemies so hopefully that isn't a problem. It does have like a, a normal length cooldown though, which means that it's not like as broken as foresight. All the abilities on screen right now are crowd control focused abilities. Abilities are often just used for this exact purpose, so if you're unsure of what ability to take since your build doesn't ask for anything in particular, just grab one of these. Especially Corrosive Cloud, Lacerating Aura, or Knife Dance. Corrosive Cloud is the only ability that can apply poison, aside from Catalyst, which is merely exclusive, and totally worse than Barricade and Foresight, so make of that what you will. Wave of Denial doesn't do any damage on its own, but can yeet enemies into walls and also has the utility of being able to blow back grenades, making it extremely useful for the Clock Tower, High Peak Castle, Steel Village and the shipwrecks with that really annoying bomb enemy. Knife Dance in particular is an interesting ability because it requires precise positioning, but the payoff is massive. Knife Dance shoots out 16 projectiles, all of which applying bleed. The interesting bit is the fact that the bleed has a base DPS of 40 and a stack duration of 4 seconds. That's a total of 160 damage per stack, and given that with 5 bleed stacks all damage is immediately dealt, you can hit a maximum of 480 damage per use and an extra stack of bleed. Hey folks, how's it going? I guess I lied to you. 
So first of all, the maths there is very wrong. So since five knives is one proc, I was like, huh, 16 knives, that would be three procs. And I just went 160 total stack damage times three, 480, called it a day, put that in script and didn't think of it again. Nah, because five stacks is one proc, but then all five of the stacks proc off. So that would be, that. that's, that, that, that's just 16 knives. All, all of them are doing the damage nonetheless. And it doesn't matter whether or not they proc instantly because you just, you, you just need to do the maths. 16 times 160. That's 2,560. Christ, that's a lot. That's a lot of numbers. That's a big number. Why not just shove all these up Ponji's bundle? Why not? Because um, I did some testing and I'm pretty sure you can't actually get all the knives off at once. Which is really sad. But, I mean, like, I think you can only get, like, four or five off, which is still around that 480 damage margin, but that's not too high. The bleed. The bleed is really good, yeah. The bleed is really, really good, but... The, the, the knives really aren't as good as I make them out to me. This is just Sam with feet spreading misinformation over the internet over an ability he thought was kind of cool. This ability, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it, I, I'm gonna butcher the name. Oh yeah. Is also falls under this category, but it is an underwhelming and risky ability. You cannot roll or parry during the duration of this ability, and it doesn't make up for it by being cancelable or having super good DPS like the 5EC Beyblade. Giant Swizzle does single target damage and is the only ability that can only hit one enemy. As such, it deals quite a lot of damage. Still not super impressive since the damage course can also be replicated by just a couple hits from most weapons, but this ability is still plentifully useful for knocking out elites from behind walls, and better than most other survival abilities at dealing damage to bosses. Picking this up is only really done in runs where you can't be asked to find anything else, which is like every survival run. Unga babunga, in Gandalf's wise words. When it comes to actually trying to deal damage to bosses though, your best bet is going to be the abilities that up your primary's damage as opposed to dealing some of its own. Such abilities come in the form of Corrupted Power, Smoke Bomb, Grappling Hook, and Phaser. Smoke Bomb, Hook, and Phaser provide utilities with their damage, the benefits of Phaser and Grappling Hook being getting close with enemies to deal massive damage, and the Smoke Bomb being a get out of jail free card in biomes. Phaser has particularly good synergy with the Assassin's Dagger due to the obvious crit condition proc, but when it comes to simply dealing damage, Phaser adds a flat damage number to the next attack, making it trivial whether or not the next attack is a full burst from the rapier or a flaccid slap from the bone, since the extra damage you're getting out of the Phaser is flat and only applied to one attack. It's basically just doing its own damage, but the scaling is pretty good so I'm not one to complain. The Smoke Bomb and Grappling Hook also only buff the next attack, but for a percentage, so it's best to spec into weapons that deal high burst damage in one hit, such as the Rapier, Valmont's Whip, Swide Sword, Impaler, or the Katana. The Grappling Hook has the added benefit of stunning enemies for a couple free hits. Corrupted Power Corrupted Power is such a meme, even after the nerf. I don't think it scales anymore, but that just means you can use it with survival. And you know how the Frontline Shield is really good, right? So what if the Frontline Shield was an ability? Well, it's not quite as good, but when you stack both of them together, you've got yourself a killer combo. The Face Flask also fits into this category, strangely enough. Since it deals negligible amount of damage to the player, it can be used to proc Vengeance for a juicy damage increase. Stacking Vengeance, the Frontline Shield, and Corrupted Power isn't like broken, but the damage output is kind of insane. You might ask about Torn. Don't use it. Obviously, Dead Cells players would kill for extra damage, but this just isn't worth. It's so buggy right now, and you're probably just going to end up dead using it. Vampirism, Barricade, and Tonic do similar things, situationally giving you more health. Tonic is great, but only if you use it at the right time. And more than often, you never actually know when it's useful and when it's not. Tonic can save your run multiple times, it just needs to be used at the right time. Vampirism is an odd case, because it gives you permanent health, which is what every Dead Cells player wants, except far too much of the time it doesn't. Since it takes your health for an on-hit lifesteal effect, Vampirism is most of the time useless, since the lifesteal isn't nearly potent enough to make up for the lost health. You have 40% health and 10 seconds to get it back with a 2% heal per melee attack. That means you have to land 20 hits in the span of 10 seconds, which shouldn't be too hard except for the fact that in 20 hits, the group of enemies you are hoping to get your health back from is probably already dead. Vampirism only really works on the Abyssal Trident, Panjaku, and Bone, only on high health targets. Barricade is basically just a scuffed version of what doesn't kill me that can be used multiple times on the same enemy, correct me if I'm wrong. It would be just that simple if it weren't for taking out the barricade, which means that the card gets rid of its health. It's a safe bet to swap out the barricade once the bonus health is already depleted. The pets are an interesting case. Mushroom Boy is inconsistent as hell. Look at that, a rampager coming at you with a force of over 10,000 newtons. Fortunately, the beheaded has the godlike ability of being able to reflect forces of over 50 kilonewtons with a piece of wood. 
Before the beheaded can parry, this son of a gun runs in first, knocking the rampager back, throwing off the beheaded's timing, causing him to get hit by the force of a small car going about 50 miles per hour, promptly exerting over 2 million pascals of pressure with its sharp claws. This is why you shouldn't use Mushroom Boy. I don't care if it's cute. Kill it now. <laughs> the Leg Hugger and Owl of War are a different case though. Both can provide consistent half-decent DPS without having to worry about turret placement. The Owl of War is particularly good at picking off flying enemies, which can be a massive pain to deal with, especially buzzcutters. One of the biggest up to the Owl of War is the fact that it can breach enemies, giving not huge but very easy openings to wear on enemies. The Leg Hugger also provides some half-decent DPS, but notably bleed damage. Bleed provides self-synergy and causes the Leg Hugger to deal critical hits for big damage. Once Leggy eats enough, he evolves like a Pokemon, and with crit can provide nearly a quarter of your damage, bleed, and give all the synergy for affix procs. With supplementary gear sorted out for the build, there's only two last subsets of build making that I've deliberately left out. Mutations and primaries. The primary weapon is a strange one to go over, since when it comes to making builds, everything has a guideline based on the primary weapon only. Everything revolves around it, basically. But when you pick up a primary weapon, since literally everything in the build revolves around it, there's nothing to go off when choosing a weapon. When it comes to choosing a primary weapon, you just have to go with your gut instinct. See which recycling tubes line up nicest. Mutations are like a whole other beast. I can make a whole video on these, but I'm just gonna go quick. They're of course supplementary like shields, secondaries, and abilities, but choosing mutations has so many strange quirks based on contextual giveaways, and sometimes it's like useless. I'm like, which, which mutations do I want? Answer none of them. They're, they're all stupid. They're all, they're all stupid and useless. Obligatory interjection, please subscribe, thanks. Obviously, you can just watch the video and try to remember everything, but what I find helps is if I were to go over some practical appliances. This section is mostly about putting what you've learned to the test. For this video, I don't want to intend on simply giving entertainment. No, I'm like the most boring person on the planet. I'm trying to spread the good word of Matt Evil Empire, also known as God, and help you become an epic big chungus wholesome 100 Fortnite gamer Reddit over TikTok. And so you're going to improve at Dead Cells, or I will rob Baby Killen's birthday money. I hope you understand exactly what I mean when I say that. Because what I'm saying, it is time for the- <laughs> Let's start with something simple. The Nutcracker is a fairly straightforward build to run. From this recycling tube, you get the Nutcracker, a parry shield, a throwing knife, ice grenade, and mushroom boy. Let's assume that the other recycling tubes are absolute garbage. They've all got oiled swords in them, don't even look at them. We're gonna leave behind the throwing knife, obviously. First of all, you know the Nutcracker can crit off stun, root, and freeze. There's three viable secondary options or shields for this run. The various ways of proccing the correct condition would include the Ice Bow, Boy's Axe, Seismic Strike, Ice Blast, Throwable Objects, Cudgel, Thunder Shield, and Ice Shield. These items all proc the crit condition, but there are a couple you might want to avoid. Seismic Strike is obviously impractical due to the slow speed. Ice Blast is most likely also a bit slow for every hit, and the Ice Bow will also need to be used between attacks as well. Your most reliable options will be the Thunder Shield, Throwable Object, and Boy's Axe. Most players don't have the patience to wait for the enemy to attack first, so they can parry and proc a crit condition. Though the Thunder Shield's massive AoE stun can be used at any time, regardless of whether or not the enemy's attacking. Root and stun are much more practical than freeze, since you can attack a rooted or stun enemies multiple times before they break free. Abilities come next. Since you have the Ice Grenade, you're only going to need to worry about prioritizing one new ability, but you can't guarantee one in particular to appear, so again, name three options here. The various options you could have are the Heavy Turret, Scavenge Bombard, Stun Grenade, Wolf Trap, Root Grenade, and Ice Armor. These are all solid options, especially the Wolf Trap, Scavenge Bombard, and maybe even the Root Grenade due to consistency, but this was a trick question. Having a spammable secondary and two abilities is kind of overkill, as you only really need one or two procs for crit synergy. In reality, you should prioritize survivability instead of more synergy. Things like Cocoon, Foresight, Tonic, and Ice Armor, which you should be using for survivability as opposed to synergy from Freeze. Ice Grenade isn't really a very reliable ability though. You should be looking for something that can consistently root, stun, or freeze bosses, so the Wolf Trap's your best bet. You should be looking for both survivability and a more consistent way to proc synergy, but prioritize survivability first. Mutations. What mutations would you pick for this build? For me, personally, I would go for Heart of Ice, obviously, Soldiers, and Gastro early game, which will be swapped out for Berserker once it reaches around 50% negation. Frostbite is actually not great if you happen to be running freeze, since the DOT causes enemies to thaw early, usually before you can actually land a crit. Here is the next recycling tube, with an Impaler, Fire Blast, the Assault Shield, Leggy, and Wave of Denial. First of all, what secondary or shield do you want given the Impaler's crit condition? 
Well, you're going to be looking for a knockback. And all you have for that is a shovel, Spartan sandals, gilded Yumi, knockback shield, and assault shield. I deliberately chose the Impaler because it has some super unorthodox and off-color synergies. Obviously, the shovel isn't a great option, and your safest bets are going to be the Spartans and the assault shield. Obviously, the shovel isn't a great option, and your safest bets are going to be the Spartans and the assault shield. Earlier on, if you find it, running the Yumi on the knockback shield off color is actually quite safe, as you're not really using them for the damage, you're using them for the utility they provide. The Yumi might be a bit awkward though. You're going to want to prioritize finding an assault shield if you can, because the ability to parry and the utility it provides is indispensable. Now for abilities, what, what might you choose? The only synergizing ability you have is Wave of Denial, which is off color. This doesn't change too much though, as what makes Wave of Denial so special is its ability to push enemies into walls, which is really helpful for a weapon that does crits off enemies that have been propped up against walls. For the rest of the abilities, you just need to pick up a safe bet mentioned previously. Cluster grenades, powerful grenades, leggy, knife dance, diverse deck, and anything else that suits your taste. Mutations. There's no good mutation to pick. Seriously. When it comes to picking mutations, like, so strange, because half the time you find yourself barely wanting any of them. Gastro is a pick mutation for any build in the same situation mutation-wise. Open Wounds or Predator might help, and No Mercy is pretty helpful as well. You might get some help out of Get Rich Quick if you're struggling on the money front, which is regrettably a mutation I don't actually have yet. One last question. You come across a recycling tube with a hand hook, throwing knife, thunder shield, turtle coil, and lightning rods. What will you use as a secondary for the hand hook? Alright, this one was a trick question. Sometimes when you see a recycling tube as holy as this, you can't pass up on it just because a primary weapon isn't great. Like, more than 90% of the time you're going to be picking secondaries and abilities based on your primary, but in rare scenarios like this, this shock build is way too holy to pass up on, and all you need is an electric whip or thunderbolt to finish up the collection. Even though running full shock doesn't actually have any practical benefits, I can promise you that you'll have a good time running this build. Tactics has a couple bread and butter mutations. Point Blank is always helpful, but Tips helps in builds using bows, and Crow's Foot can be used in shieldless runs. Most of the time you're still good at picking the old reliable Gastro No Mercy combo though. That's it. That's literally everything you need to know about making builds. Be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and have a good one. Ah, and one last tip. If you run Oiled Sword, O plus Ratio plus Cringe plus You Fell Off plus No Maidens plus Skill Issue plus Get Good plus Mold plus C plus Cry About It plus Stay Mad plus Report It plus Chew Out Okay, you can go now. I made an outro. You happy?